the gap between designers and developers, uh, which I didn't make it to the keynote this morning, but apparently he's already started off the whole bridging theme with PHP and Rails, so <laughs> I'm not real sure. Uh, this guy at the office is not allowed to know about that. Um, so, you know, I figured I'd start off and kind of give a little bit of a backstory of uh, kind of where I've come from uh, and maybe some of the things that I've been able to experience and observe that kind of led to um, this idea. <clears throat> So about seven years ago, uh, I banded together with two business partners to start an agency called Oodle. Uh, so it was, when it was in its infant form, um, I was a designer. So it was basically, I was a designer, uh, John was a developer, and Mark was a business guy. So we had that trifecta and you know, we went out and thought we were gonna do great things. And, uh, we did, we've grown to be a pretty significantly sized agency now, but through that journey, uh, I've gone from being the only designer that we had uh, to spending my days today writing mainly code. Um, front end and back end and you know, all of that fun stuff. So through that journey and through working with other designers and developers, some of which who were great, some of which who were not so great, uh, you know, I've learned a lot and you know, seen a lot of things. Number one being, you know, kind of the, the rift between designers and developers. There's the, like the fundamental split between the, the left brain and right brain. Just out of curiosity, how many like, people would consider themselves mainly a designer here? All right, that's what I figured was gonna happen. <laughs> how many devs? <laughs> All right, everybody, yeah. So, you know, It'd be, a, it'd be an unfair fight if I were to like split and be like, all right, we are actually gonna do the Braveheart thing. Uh, but you know, the idea is that designers are, are creative and they don't really get what developers do and developers kind of feel the same way. That you know, designers don't really feel the pain uh, of slicing up some comp or meeting some weird expectation or need or desire of a client or uh, even a, a customer. So you know, as I started thinking about this, I was like, you know, that. It's interesting because it uh, gets reinforced constantly. Like even little comics like this that, uh, you know, they are showing exactly how different uh, a designer and a developer are. But at the core level, they're really the exact same almost. Uh, they just have different tendencies. So, you know, as I continue to think about this and, you know, the kind of the divide uh, that exists, I was like, you know, really all we're doing uh, is distracting us from the one thing that we want to do, which is to build great cons customer experiences. And I know there's probably kind of a mixture, you know, we're obviously, I'm here from the agency perspective because that's what I do every day, but um, you know, I know some of you are with product development and kind of singular focus, uh, which I envy often. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we're all focused on building great customer experiences uh, whether it's for a client or whether it's for, you know, kind of the end customer. And you need both design and development working together in order to do that. However, we keep putting them in boxes uh, and, you know, separating them. So much so that as I was talking to uh, Jake this morning about this talk, and I was like, you know, there's, there's really kind of that, that divide winds up silently uh, getting amplified, uh, even within our own office. So in our office, you know, as we started to, to hire creative and hire developers and even refer to the creative and development department, uh, we slowly found out that you know, everybody kind of exists in these pods and there is literally a wall between design and development in our office. <laughs> uh, and you know, th we need to kind of figure out how to tear those down in order to do things better. So when we go to, talk, when we go to create a good, great customer experience, you know, how do we do that? Uh, well, it all starts with a kickoff of some kind. In our world it does, and in most worlds, you're going to have an initial meeting or something where somebody came up with an idea, they presented it and they said, yes, let's do that. Uh, how do we get that done? I don't know, let's talk to this guy. And ultimately, uh, you've got this kickoff, everybody leaves the kickoff, they're excited, 
Uh, they have ideas of where they're going to go, what they're going to do. Maybe you've got some action items, uh, a formal plan, or you've got a project manager who's going to take all that stuff. You might even have a defined process of something like this. I literally just Googled web development process, uh, and everything looked like this. And then I, I laughed because I was like, I've shown this to clients before. Like, not this one, but a branded version of this. And, you know, the idea is that, you know, there's this planning process where, you know, you come up with the project management plan and the timeline and uh, the risk, maybe you're really complicated and you've got, like, risk management and all those sorts of things. And then once we have that figured out, we know exactly when we're going to deploy this thing and there's definitely not going to be any delays. Uh, so we can go straight into design where we do those wireframes. Maybe we'll build some prototype uh, things using something like Envision, like the hot link uh, sort of prototypes. And then once the designer's done with it, we're going to hand it over to development. Development's going to code it. They're going to uh, hopefully test it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we launch it. Everybody's excited. Uh, you know, you do that final testing. Uh, and then there's just maintenance, ongoing, forever. Um, you know, everything kind of follows this, whether it's an app, whether it's a website, whether it's a web application, something like that. The reality is it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it never works that way. Uh, there's always something that pops up. There's always uh, these blurred lines where you know, design and dev specifically, um, it's just not that clean. You can't hand a flat Photoshop comp off and expect that, uh, you know, what gets created is actually going to be something good. So the best way that I can think to, uh, to talk about that is to look at an example. Uh, so I made up an example that reflects or embodies a lot of the uh, things that I've seen happen at our shop a hundred times. Um, so again, following that process, we have a design. Uh, just for the sake of uh, keeping my own thoughts together, we're going to say that we have a, a designer named Carl. And Carl was tasked with creating a design for uh, a cooking class. Really wants to go with this like contemporary, simple design, uh, but still you know, have kind of that creative flair something with a strong CTA. So Carl comes up with, with this design. Super proud of it. Uh, you have the design and dev handoff, and uh, Joan, our developer, takes over, and she says, yeah, this looks, uh, this looks fine. I, I think we can do this. Uh, so Carl goes about, and you know, in our world, Carl moves on to the next project uh, that is on his plate, and Joan goes to work coding this site. Three weeks later, uh, Carl hears, you know, the website that you built for that cooking class, it launched, it's up, um, it's going pretty good. He's like, oh, cool, I'm going to go check it out, see what it looks like when it's live. So, hopefully this works, yeah, I did. So Carl goes out to the web and uh, pulls it up in the browser and looks at it and kind of, it's like, all right, well, this uh, isn't really what I thought it was going to look like which is weird because it looks exactly like the, the Photoshop comp that we just looked at. So Carl goes over to, to Joan's office and is like, hey, what's going on? Like, this looks nothing like I intended it to. It, there's, it's very flat, it's very boring, there's nothing going on. Uh, why is this? We talked about all these other things that we could do, but at the end of the day, it, it's just boring, it's kind of flat. But Joan's also pissed because Joan's like, well, what do, you, what do you mean? I even gave you like this cool rollover effect. Where's my mouse? All right, I lost my mouse. <laughs> all right, well, you know, there's a, the button rollover effect and all that kind of stuff, and she doesn't understand why, why would, uh, there we go. It even fades in and out. Carl didn't put a rollover effect in the PSD. Joan had to infer that and kind of went the extra mile there. And, you know, they're both, so they're both mad. They're both mad because, you know, they feel like, Joan feels like she did what she was supposed to do. Uh, Carl feels like, you know, their work was kind of underrepresented. Uh, so, you know, that just creates this giant uh, war and 
you know, perhaps they're going back and forth and they're trying to figure out, you know, how to fix it or whatever. And at the end of the day, we're just kind of sitting with a little shitty product. product. And, uh, you know, we have to solve that. So how do we solve that? Well, the first step is admitting that there's a problem, as with everything. And uh, in our world, there's lots of problems. <laughs> uh, just looking at the web, I started like, just writing some, some down. Uh, we have all sorts of problems. We have you know, new things like WebGL that we're not really sure how it all works yet or what the capabilities are. We have you know, animations, we've got parallax stuff, we've got 3D transforms, we've got design aspects of those and you know, design principles. And then there's also the technical side with limitations, things like Internet Explorer that blows up everything you give it. Uh, you know, so these become problems and you know, how, do we, how does a designer uh, portray that they want you to use some fancy WebGL effect or how do they portray using 3D transforms? Uh, how do they even know what 3D transforms exist uh, you know, to use? Those are all problems. Second step is figuring out how to work together uh, and overcome those problems. And you have to do it together. So as I was thinking about, you know, where, how do you, how do you do that, and uh, you know, where can you work together? Because that's kind of a broad brush thing. I stumbled across this graphic, which is, you know, something that we use to kind of show how everything kind of goes through. And ultimately, most people are probably following a similar model because Scrum is a cool thing that everybody's excited about now, uh, where there's some sort of task that you're doing, there's some sort of weekly cycle or monthly cycle or hopefully not quarterly, but uh, there's some sort of deployment and there's a feedback loop of some sort. So I was like, well, you know, we think about this feedback area uh, as getting feedback from the stakeholders. Oftentimes that's like customers, clients, executive, et cetera. What we never really think about there is the internal stakeholders. So, you know, when we look at this, there's a perfect opportunity here to bring in internal stakeholders through the development life cycle and through the design life, life cycle. And the great thing is we already have a spot where we should be doing it anyways, so it's easy to just kind of connect the dots there. So what's that look like? Uh, you know, there's a few keys, I think, to having this successful feedback loop. Um, number one is entering with a plan. So it starts at the level of planning to have those internal uh, feedback touch points. Uh, but then in those, you have to plan for what you're going to do. If you, if you just have a meeting where you're like, all right, you know, we're gonna show you the progress and that's it, uh, Carl, our designer, may not actually know what he's supposed to present uh, as potential problems. He may just show up and say, yeah, it looks, looks fine. And then ultimately get to the end and do the, have the exact same reaction, uh, which I'm sure some of you have experienced, where you've asked for feedback along the way and uh, none was given and at the end it's still the same situation. Uh, so you have to plan for the type of feedback. You have to coach for um, you know, looking for effects or looking for making sure that you're meeting the design intent uh, that they're looking for and vice versa. Designers in that feedback process need to solicit feedback from developers to say, you know, we as people who write code know a lot of things that affect the customer experience and ultimately affect the design output uh, that designers just don't know about, perhaps, uh, or exactly how it works. So being in that mindset of providing detailed feedback um, and direction is important. Second one is asking questions often. Um, you know, I can't count the number of times that, you know, through a, a development process, if I, I get to the end and think, you know, if I had just asked the designer, like, why we have five different font sizes in this, I could have saved quite a bit of time and code and hassle on my end because the reality is I get to the end and the designer looks at it and they're like, why are these like slightly different? And uh, we wind up consolidating the one font size anyways because in Photoshop it's really easy just to kind of tweak that stuff by a pixel or two and not even realize it. The same is true 
uh, on the design side. There are things that uh, you know, perhaps a designer will try to fit something into a nice neat little box because they know that uh, somebody likes to use Bootstrap for their grid system or something and it's just kind of not working. Uh, I think about like five column layouts or like five boxes side by side doesn't work with the standard bootstrap layout. Uh, but the reality is if the designer just says, hey, uh, I need five side by side, how can I do that? And you're like, oh yeah, it's fine, just do it. Because uh, it's not that much code. So asking questions and keeping that open dialogue between kind of the design and the dev crew um, is important. And lastly, I think, you know, going uh, the extra mile. You know, it's a, a little bit cliche, I think, but, you know, as you're progressing through the project, I think remembering that everybody has the same intent or desired output of a great cu customer experience, uh, going that extra mile and searching for something or bringing something up later in the process uh, is important. You know, the, the whole idea, I think the, the boxes of designers and developers being very different people, along with that whole process, can often lead to a developer thinking that if, if something's in the design phase, I don't need to worry about it. In fact, I shouldn't worry about it. Um, the reality is you should. You should go the extra mile and care about it during the design process. The same is true when it's in development. You know, if you, if you move on as a designer to your next project and kind of purge this one from your memory, which ultimately in the example that I gave is exactly what happened. Carl moved on to his next project uh, because he was done with the design piece and it's moved to development and per the little circles, it's never gonna come back to development or design. Uh, and you know, by never checking in, there was never that gentle nudge to say, well, we're kind of off track here. Uh, can we bring it back to center? And there actually isn't a third step at all. I tried to think of another step. And I was like, you know, really it's, it's all about working together and kind of those three principles of having a plan, asking questions, and going the extra mile for your counterparts that uh, is truly important. And if we do that, you know, we can help to bridge that gap a little bit. So now I'm gonna rewind uh, and, you know, think about what could have happened to the exact same project uh, had we done that. So we started off with you know, a great kickoff, everybody was excited. We created a plan to you know, have a weekly review so that in the three weeks that it took Joan to create the simple page, which would be slightly obnoxious, uh, <laughs> there were touch points where those two are talking to each other and they're uh, actually looking at the how it's all coming together, and oh, that's no good. There we go. So it actually came together a little bit nicer. It looks fundamentally, it looks the same, uh, but we've got this nice little radiating heat effect, which was ultimately something that Carl wanted. They wanted this the subtle. Uh, effects, but you've also got the, the little perspective shift as the mouse moves around. So it takes something that, you know, these are two very minute little features that the designer, as they were looking, you know, perhaps found that, uh, saw somebody else do the mouse perspective thing, and were like, that's pretty cool. We could do that with this because it's really simple, and it gives some dynamic movement, and, you know, uh, a little bit nicer feel. Uh, but by never checking in, never actually gave we're able to give Joan the gentle nudge. So now, you know, we've taken our little poo and we've polished the poo a little bit. Uh, that tight scope still kind of sucks, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, so there, at the end of it, you know, I, as I think about it, you know, designers and developers aren't really all that different. Uh, we're all people who have a common goal of building great customer experiences. Um, and you know, we use the tools that we have at our disposal to do that. Uh, designers work in Photoshop and Sketch, and developers work in you know, Vim and a million other code editors. Uh, so you know, I think if we understand that and we understand that you know, we can contribute to each other's work uh, 
heavily, I think we can kind of break down some of the barriers and produce some better work. That's all I got. Thank you.